Okay, good morning everyone. Today I'm going to be speaking to you about the uh, richest, most powerful, most profitable, most ruthless company in history. That's the Dutch East India Company, or as it was better known, the VOC. Now as we learned a few days ago, uh, back in 1497, Vasco da Gama was the first person to discover a sea route all the way from Europe uh, to India. And since that time, after that time, uh, the Portuguese absolutely dominated trade to the Far East and also dominated the Indian Ocean in total. If you wanted to trade in the, if you wanted to sail through the Indian Ocean, you had to have what was called the Cartes license. Now, this was a license that was only be able to obtain by the from the Portuguese, and it meant that um, you could you could sail around the, the Indian Ocean. If you didn't have that license, then your cargo, your ship, and even your life might be forfeited to the Portuguese. And no one, everyone knew that the Portuguese were making a lot of money out of this trade with the Far East, but no one knew exactly how much money that they were actually making. Until in 1592, the English privateer, who was a, a privateer is a state-sponsored pirate basically, by the name of Christopher Newport. And we'll talk about Newport a little bit later on. I remember I did a talk about the Unknown Heroes a while ago and the man who stole the Suez Canal, uh, George Nares, who was the first person to transverse the Suez Canal in a ship called HMS Newport. That ship was named after Christopher Newport, and I'll speak about Christopher Newport in another talk a bit later on. But he, along with three ships that he commanded, captured the Portuguese trading vessel, the Madre de Juice. Now, this wasn't a large vessel that would easily fit on the stage, the Madre de Juice, uh, but the cargo that it had on board, which accounted to uh, millions of dollars. So once they took that cargo back to London, the cargo was sold, the uh, Newport and his men received their share of the, the spoils of that, of that um, uh, trade. The rest of the money went to the, the English crown and the money went into the English treasury and there was so much money that it uh, increased the English treasury by 50%, in, which is just an enormous amount. I mean, from one trading vessel, one small trading vessel. So once this actually made the rest of the world stand up and take notice of this trade that was happening in the Far East. And now everyone wanted to be a part of it. Now, the Portuguese kept their trading secrets strictly to themselves. No one else was allowed to be involved in, in their, their trade. No other nationality. But two Dutchmen by the name of Cornelius de Houtman and Jan van Lynchentoken um, ingratiated their way into the Portuguese system over a number of years, both in different areas. And quite fortuitously, these men came together in the, uh, the Netherlands in 1594. And they learned that they knew a lot of information about the, the Portuguese systems, both from different sides. So they wrote a report, and it was named the Report of a Journey Through the Navigations of the Portuguese in the Far East. And that doesn't actually roll off the tongue. It doesn't sound like a real page turner, but it was incredible for its time because it gave all the information that no one had known before. Information about uh, what sort of things they were trading for, who they were trading with, uh, what sort of money the Portuguese were paying for these, this trade, uh, what sort of money they were getting when they sold the, the goods. It gave information about uh, areas to trade, what was it, which vices came from which area. It gave details about anchorages and prevailing currents and tides and things like that. Uh, so lots and lots of information. And once again, the world took notice because this was incredible stuff. And so in, 19, in uh, 1595, de Houtman decided that he would lead an expedition to the Far East on behalf of the Dutch to try and take advantage of what he had discovered. He took four ships, the Amsterdam, the Hollandia, the Mauritius and the Dovkin, and uh, he was going to sail away and bring these four ships back full of, full of spices and make himself a very rich man. They sailed down under the Cape of Good Hope, where we are now, and by the time they arrived in Madagascar on the east coast of Africa, trouble had started. Uh, there had been sickness on board the ships. The scourge of sailors of that time was scurvy. And while they're in Madagascar, 70 of his men succumbed to scurvy. And you can still go to see what's known as the Dutch graves in, in Madagascar to this day. Um, by that time, there wasn't enough crew to, to uh, crew all four ships, so we distributed the crew amongst three ships and destroyed the other ship. 
And then they sailed off to Java, which was one of the areas where he had information about through this report. And when they got there, they were greeted quite well by the local ruler of uh, the province in Java. And they were told that these Javanese would be happy to trade with the Dutch. But uh, they were also told that the last harvest had just been harvested, had been sold to the Portuguese. They weren't going to have anything more for a, a few months, but they were welcome to stay. So um, de Houtman decided that he would stay until the next crop had been harvested. But um, the Dutch were fairly arrogant people at this time, and um, they treated the, the Javanese as, as below them. Uh, these, they said that these men weren't educated, um, they weren't travelled like the, the Dutch were, they didn't have the same skills, they, they wore strange clothing, they had strange habits. So the Portuguese, sorry, the, the Dutch uh, treated them with contempt and they would take anything that they wanted, including some of the women that had been at sea for a long time after all. And this angered the Javanese and the ruler of Java ordered the, uh, that de Houtman and his men leave without uh, leave empty-handed without uh, being able to buy anything. They were cruising through the, the region and they, one of the ships was attacked by pirates and several of de Houtman's men were killed. Now this, along with the frustration of not being able to purchase anything in Java, uh, really made de Houtman angry. They were sailed to the island of Madura and he ordered his men to go ashore and even though he knew that the people of Madura had had nothing to do with the pirate attack, he ordered revenge and his men went ashore and they raped and murdered dozens of people on the island of Madura. And it sort of set the, the, um, the benchmark of Dutch exploration at that time. They were able to go to, to Bali, but by this time there wasn't enough men for three ships, so he destroyed one of those, the other ships and the crew were distributed amongst the final two ships. In Bali they were able to purchase some peppercorns and um, uh, once they had purchased them, de Houtman thought, okay, that's enough, we need to return to the, to the Netherlands. They set sail again, they came around the Cape again. Um, by this time, there was more sickness on board. The men were, had very little food and water. They pulled into the Portuguese territory of um, St. Helena and they weren't allowed to go ashore by the authorities in St. Helena. Uh, <laughs> So they were made it back to the Netherlands. By this time, though, of the 249 men that had left the ne originally left the Netherlands, there was only 87 left alive, and they were in terrible, terrible shape. So it looks like a disaster. Only brought back two ships and 87 men. But the profits from that peppercorn were so massive that this voyage was seen as a huge success. And over the next five years, more than 40 expeditions went out from the Netherlands, from all the provinces around the Netherlands to try and get out and take advantage of this new trade and learn from what had been in that, uh, that original report. Now at the time, I mean, as these vessels went off, uh, because of the trade winds in the Indian Ocean, the monsoon winds, they often arrived at a location at exactly the same time, which drove up the price that they could purchase these products for and they often arrived back in the Netherlands at exactly the same time as well, which drove down the price that um, they were getting for these goods. So there had to be a better way of doing this. And the other problem was that if you were an investor, you could go down to the wharves and you could see a vessel that was about to depart on a voyage, and you could invest in that ship or in that expedition overall. You could perhaps buy a 10% equity in that voyage. And if that ship came back three years later, full of spices, then you were a very rich man. But you had to wait that three years to see whether there was any return on your investment at all, which would have been a, a very stressful time because quite often those ships didn't come back at all and which meant your investment was completely gone. Once again, there had to be a better way. Now at the time, sorry, the Netherlands was made up of six self-governing uh, provinces or chambers as they were called. And over the top of them, they had a, a, a central governing body called the States General. So very similar to what they've got in the United States with the 50 states and then Washington DC and what we've got in Australia where we've got the, the self-governing states and the centralised mm, government in Canberra, um, shambles in Canberra. Um, <laughs> and um, the, po the population in the Netherlands was only 1.5 million people. It was a tiny country. Now, the states, states General decided that there had to be something done about this because all these different chambers were competing against each other for trade. 
They were fighting amongst each other. They were driving the prices up in the Far East. They were driving the prices down and when they came back. Um, they were pinching crews from each other and trying to sabotage each other. So something had to be done. So they brought all the chambers together and they tried to work out, negotiated a, a settlement. And on the 20th of March, 1602, the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, was formed as a single trading entity. And it was decided that um, between, the, between the, the six chambers and the States General, a total of six and a half million guilders, worth about a hundred million US dollars in today's um, uh, terms, was to be put in to start this venture. So it was a pretty good bankroll to start the thing off to begin with. The Heron 17, or a board of directors, was formed. And this was formed from the six chambers. So Amsterdam, being the, the, um, the biggest and most powerful, the richest of these chambers, put in half of the six and a half million guilders to begin with. So they were going to have eight representatives on the, the Heron 17. Uh, Middleburg, or Zeeland region, uh, put in some money as well. They were going to ha have four representatives. And then the other chambers, Rotterdam, Delft, Horn, and Eekhuizen, were going to have one member on the Heron 17. Now, there's a lot of people doing the math out there right now, and you can see that that doesn't add up to 17. That's actually 16 people. Um, so it was the theme that because they didn't want Amsterdam to dominate this board, that each of the other five chambers would take it in turns to rotate each year to add an extra member onto their, their, um, their board. So they'd be, have, be 17 members of the Heron 17. Now, the, Port the Dutch knew that the Portuguese weren't just going to lie down and let the, uh, the Dutch come in and take over their territory. So when they established the charter for the... Um, oh, sorry, this is the, the boardroom of the Heron 17. Uh, it's a, a room in uh, Amsterdam University in, um, at the moment. You can make an appointment. You have to make an appointment to go and see it. They won't let you just walk in. But um, it's a very interesting place. It was exactly... Exactly the same as what it was when the Heron 17 sat around these tables. And um, this was by far the most powerful room in the world at its time. But they realised that um, they were going to need some extraordinary powers in their charter. And their charter was only going to last for 21 years to begin with, with the options to renew it if they wanted to. So the charter, and this is a copy of the, the charter, in there it deemed that they could, the VOC could form their own military force, their own army and their own navy. They could negotiate any treaties they wanted with kingdoms or um, uh, uh, princes or emirs or any sort of rules in any sort of province anywhere in their sphere of influence. They could wage war, and they often did wage war. They could torture, trial, imprison and execute people. Uh, they had their own laws and they could do this often without any sort of jurisprudence or, or rule of law whatsoever. They could issue their own currency and they could control the value of that currency against other currencies all around the world and they have given full powers to act from this area where we are right now at the bottom of um, the Cape of Good Hope all the way over the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean all the way over to the Straits of Magellan or um, Cape Horn. So more than half the world's surface and even then as we'll see later they also operated outside that area sometimes as well. Now, these are the powers of a country, but this wasn't a country. This was a company uh, operating uh, on, as a company. It uh, didn't have to report to those pesky voters every four years and be told that they were doing things wrong. They had to report to the Heron 17, and all the Heron 17 were interested was one thing, and that was profit. That was all they ever cared about. Now, they got off to a very good... Oh, so there's some really good advantages to the Dutch in this arrangement as well, because the VOC paid a tax of 18% to the Dutch government, and over the years that became an enormous sum of money, and they were able to do a lot with that, uh, that money. Uh, there was advantages to the Dutch, uh, to the Netherlands, because in the Netherlands you could invest... For, you could, interest rates were only 4%, where around the rest of Europe they were 10% and more, so more and more investment came into the Netherlands. They were, because you, you, if you're building a ship, to build that ship you need shipbuilders, you need materials, you need tools for those men, you need accommodation, you need food, you need education for their children. Um, all those things which created more businesses in, throughout the Netherlands and created what we call the sticky dollar, 
where that money just circulated all throughout the, the economy of the Netherlands, which made, and tax was paid on that, so it made the Netherlands very, very rich. And by 1648, the Netherlands was in better financial condition than any other country in Europe. But it also gave the Netherlands the, uh, the Dutch government uh, deniability, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Part of what they used that money for was a land reclam reclamation in the Netherlands. And you can see here a map of the, the Netherlands in 1300, the, the area there, and then an area, a map of the 19th and, and uh, 20th centuries. Now, they took back a lot of the land that had been lost. They built these huge levees and dikes along that Atlantic coast, along the, the coast where the North Sea uh, is, so to protect their, their land from the North Sea. There's amazing infrastructure through the Netherlands. They built lots of dams uh, and canals uh, with, with locks, and they were able to use windmills to pump the water out of their country into the North Sea and claim back a lot of that land. And, and today, even though the Netherlands is a tiny country, uh, it exports, it's the second largest exporter of vegetables anywhere in the world, so quite remarkable. And this is an exam example of some of the dikes along that, um, that coast of the North Sea, which is, as you can see, is a lovely calm place to go cruising as well. Now, they got off to a very, very good start. Um, the VOC was considered to be the, the first multinational company anywhere in the world. So the, um, the British East India Company had been formed the year before, in 1601, but only Brits were allowed to invest in the, the British East India Company, and you had to be very wealthy to be able to invest in that. But with the VOC, anyone could invest in that, and all you really needed was 3,000 guilders to do so. And 3,000 guilders was well within the grasp of most middle-class people and merchants around the Netherlands, so it attracted a lot more investment. Now, it was also the very first company to issue and trade shares, and here's an example of a share from 1623. Um, and this made it, this was a great idea as well, because instead of having to go down and invest in one ship, waiting three years to see whether there was any return on your investment, you could now go and buy a share in the whole company. It uh, uh, broke up the, the, um, the, the risk involved. And if you wanted to, to, to cash in your shares, you could do so, and you might make money depending on the, the value of that share at the time, just as we, we do these days. But this was very a new concept at the time. And so more and more people invested in the Dutch East India Company, making it even richer. It went on to become the largest and most valuable corporation in history. And if you look at this, this is an example in today's dollars, you've got Microsoft, which is about to become a trillion dollar company. Bill Gates is going to become a trillionaire uh, fairly soon. But at the height of its powers, in today's money, the VOC was worth nearly seven and a half trillion dollars, a massive company. And if you combine um, Microsoft, Google, and Apple today, it's three of the biggest companies in the world today, if you combine all those three companies, uh, the VOC was still three times bigger than, this, than these th three companies combined. Uh, and once again, they had their own army and their own navy uh, to support them as well. And it all came down to this, spices. Now, we take these for granted now. We can go to the supermarket when we get the chance to go to a supermarket, and we can buy these on the shelves, and they're very, very common. But back in those days, these were a very luxurious commodity for people. And these were the, the rich, the most profitable things in the world. They were worth more than gold and silver around the world. In um, one year after the VOC were established, uh, VOC ships were able to capture a, a Portuguese carrack, which is a type of ship named the Santa Catarina. And on board that vessel were things like silk and porcelain. It was captured off the coast of Hong Kong. Uh, and they'd, got, they'd traded goods in China. And there was silk on board, porcelain, uh, worth about three and a half million guilders. So the year before, the total investment into the VOC was six and a half million guilders. One year, less than one year later, they've got a return of three and a half million guilders from one ship, one Portuguese ship. And you can still buy what's known as carrick porcelain all around the world that came from, from that ship. Now, the Portuguese obviously weren't really impressed with all this, so they complained to the Dutch that um, your vessels have, have uh, taken our vessel, 
And the Dutch government were able to say, well, it's got nothing to do with us. It was the VOC. They're a private company. The Dutch were, had the ability of deniability. They had a lot of treaties and alliances around Europe at that time, and they didn't want to damage those alliances by, by being associated with the VOC. So the VOC were at arm's length. But the, the Portuguese still weren't impressed. So it began the, um, the Dutch-Portuguese War, which was to last for 60 years. But even that was a good thing for the VOC, because it, now it meant that they could attack any Portuguese facility or ship uh, with impunity. They had the right to do so now. In 1605, so uh, four years after they were first established, they established a permanent base in Ambon, Indonesia, and started appointing what they called Governors General, who was the most important person. That was the person that was going to oversee all of the operations in the Far East. So by 1669, it was the richest private company the world has ever seen. They had 150 merchant ships, uh, 40 naval ships or warships. They had 50,000 employees working for them. There was a, a private army of 10,000 men, and they could add to that by adding mercenaries to, to that as well. And um, they paid a dividend of 40% on the original investment, which is, you know, we'd be pretty happy to get that in today, wouldn't we? But they were also the most ruthless company in history. And one of the prime examples of this was happened in the Banda Islands, which is this area here, Ambon around there. So in uh, May 1609, um, so the, the Banda Islands were the only place in the world that grew nutmeg, which was a very, very profitable commodity. Um, and so to protect that, so 1609, which was only eight years after the VOC were established, the second most senior person in the VOC in the Far East, the second in command, Admiral Verhoff, was sent to um, the uh, Band Islands to establish a fort there, to protect their, their supply of nutmeg. And he was going to establish Fort Nassau. Now, the Bandanese weren't real happy about dealing with the Dutch. They preferred to deal with the Portuguese and the English because those people traded with them with, for things that they found useful, like pots and pans and cooking things, uh, axes and, and knives, things like that that they found useful. Whereas the Dutch only really wanted to trade things like heavy materials, weren't real, which weren't suitable for, for wearing in the, uh, the tropics of the, of the Far East. So the Bandanese weren't real happy about this at all, uh, that this fort was going to be established. But they had no choice. But they thought they had to do something. So when there was a great feast where Admiral Verhoff attended, the, at the orders of the king of the Banda Islands, uh, his warriors jumped out and they massacred Verhoff and 46 Dutchmen. Um, the other parties, dozens of other Dutchmen, escaped by the skin of their teeth by rushing back to their ships, including a young um, merchant by the name of Jan um, Peterson Cohen, and we'll talk about him a little bit later on. In 1610, the British decided that they wanted to protect their assets in the region as well, so they established a fort on the nearby island of I, which is spelled A-I. But the VOC didn't want them there, so five years later they attacked. They drove the British out of the fort, uh, the British sailed away in their ships. But when they got across the, over the horizon, the British regrouped, and that night they went back to I, they attacked the Dutch, killing several, and drove them out of the fort and reoccupied the fort. So the next year the Dutch came back and uh, they besieged the fort in I. Uh, after three months, the British were running low on supplies like ammunition and on food and water. So the British negotiated with the, with the Dutch that they should be able to leave with safe conduct and the, the Dutch could have access, would, would take over the fort, and which was all agreed to. But as the British were leaving the fort with no arms, they were completely unarmed, the Dutch, the VOC soldiers descended upon them and massacred every man, woman and child. Um, coming from that fort. And that was known as the Massacre of I. Now, the Banda Islands weren't finished with, unfortunately. In 1621, Jan Peterson Cohen had risen to the ranks of Governor General of the VOC. He still remembered escaping by the skin of his teeth uh, back in 1609. He wanted revenge. So he went back to the Banda Islands with a group of mercenaries who were Japanese samurai. And he called a meeting of all the chieftains from the islands to one location, and then he killed them all. He cut off their heads, uh, or the Japanese samurai cut off their heads and put them on pikes uh, around the island. 
And then he ordered his men to go throughout the Banda Islands and massacre any Bandanese that they could find. And this was one of the very first examples of ethnic cleansing. And it's estimated that there was between five and 6,000 Bandanese living on these islands. But after the end of that uh, ethnic cleansing, there was probably only two dozen left alive. And they were put into slavery um, by, the, by the VOC. Now, Cohen decided to split the Banda Islands into 63 separate plantations. And he gifted these plantations to Dutchmen. And their one job, they were given slaves, but their one job was to grow nutmeg and sell that nutmeg to the VOC. And in return, they were going to receive one 122nd, and that's not easy to say, I can tell you, one 122nd share in the profits of that nutmeg, which doesn't seem like a really good deal at all, does it? Because you've done all the work, you've grown this stuff, you've given it to the VOC, and you're only getting one share out of 122. But the nutmeg was so valuable that even that one share made these 63 men and their families incredibly wealthy uh, over, the turn, over the journey. Jan Peterson Cohen, uh, he became the dominant figure of the VOC. He, uh, he often said, despair not, spare your enemies not, because he never did, because God is with us. Um, he was Governor General, and he often also said that war was necessary to produce and protect trade, but that trade was necessary if you were going to wage war. In other words, you needed the profits from that trade to be able to uh, afford to be able to wage war, which is what the Dutch did. In 1619, he led 19 Dutch naval vessels, and they attacked the, the little village, fishing village of Jakarta in Java, and they destroyed that village, and then they recreated uh, a city that they called Batavia, uh, and that became their trading headquarters. We now know it as Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. And it became the most important trading hub anywhere in the world. So Cohen, and there's statues of, of Cohen all over the Netherlands. He's a national hero there for what he did. But he was responsible for the ethnic cleansing of Banda in 1621, as I explained. But he was also responsible for an incredible trading network. And this was the East Asia trading network, where it was based in Batavia. And they had tentacles out all over the far, the far East, including to Japan, China, India, Ceylon, even as far across as the, the Middle East, the countries of the Middle East. And all this trade would be funneled back through to the Netherlands, making that country incredibly wealthy. And if you ever go to Jakarta, you'll see that the Dutch tried to recreate uh, a home away from home. They built canals through the city, through this city. And over those canals, they've got uh, small bridges and they've got promenades along the side of those canals, trying to make it a home away from home. Yeah, the VOC had a lot of other influence as well, and I mean, it would take 10 talks to talk about all the, the things that they did. But because we're off the, case, the coast of Cape Town right now, I'll talk about, a little bit about Cape Town and also the discovery of Australia. So Cape Town was the, um, the, a logical place for them to go because this was the halfway mark between Europe and the, the Batavia. So it became an ideal stop-off plate place to be able to rest the crews, reprovision the, the, uh, the ships, either on the way to Batavia or on the way back to the Netherlands. So uh, the colony of, the, of Cape Town was established in 1652. And at first, they just bought goods in from the Netherlands and, and supplied the ships that way. But as more and more ships kept on coming to and from the Far East, it was decided that something more had to be done. So Dutch farmers uh, were given land in this new colony. And they were told to grow things like vegetables and to, to, um, uh, to produce cattle and poultry and, and pigs, etc., etc., uh, wood, timber, to supply these ships as they were coming to and from uh, the Netherlands. And those Dutch farmers went on to become the Boer farmers of South Africa. Now, they, those Boer farmers could only trade with the VOC. They weren't allowed to trade with any other entity whatsoever. And the VOC were quite harsh towards these farmers. They allowed them to import slaves from Eastern Africa, and those slaves were uh, put onto these farms. But then when things started getting busier and busier, they also indentured local natives to work on these farms. And they, um, they became uh, to cross purposes there. And then because they had to deal with the VOC, which was a harsh 
entity to deal with, they treated their slaves quite harshly as well. And it's now known that the VOC are at least partially responsible for the introduction of apartheid in South Africa. They also did some good things. I mean, I've been saying a lot of negative things about the VOC, but they also did some, some very, very good things, one of which was the establishment of the wine industry. And it's a pity we're not calling into to Cape Town because they, um, they have some incredible wine tours from Cape Town out to the wine regions of the area. Um, Lee took full advantage of it um, last year. They, <laughs> she can attest that they, uh, they are very generous with their portion sizes when they're handing out their wine. They are also responsible for the discovery of Australia. Now, when I went to school, we had a very British curriculum at school, and um, we were always told that Captain Cook discovered Australia in 1770. Every other Australian is told the same thing? Yeah. Yep. And even when we were in Townsville a few weeks ago, we found this plate at a charity shop, and it says, that this, uh, this is commemorate the discovery of Australia by Captain Cook in 1770. So this is what we were taught. But Cook wasn't um, the first person to discover Australia. He wasn't the first Englishman to set foot in Australia, but we'll cover that at a later date as well. The Dutch had been here more than 160 years before. In uh, William Jansoon uh, left Batavia in November of 1605 aboard his vessel, the Dovekin, which means little dove or little bird. Uh, and there's a replica of the Dovekin, which is a tiny, tiny ship uh, that you can see in, in Perth in Western Australia. Uh, and he landed on the northern coast of Australia, the area we now know as the, Gulf, the Gulf of Carpentaria, on February the 26th, 1606. Now, this is the wet season in northern Australia, so it was very, very wet. He landed near where the mangrove swamps were as well, so there was a lot of water on the ground. Uh, it reminded him of his province back in the Netherlands, of Zealand. So he named this new country New Zealand. Now, Australians love New Zealanders. We, don't, we consider them family rather than, than friends, but we've got a great rivalry with them as well, sporting rivalry with them. And I love telling New Zealands, we even beat you to be called, be named New Zealand uh, than you did. Um, he named the Gulf of Carpentaria after um, the Governor General of the, the, East, the Dutch East India Company at the time. Uh, and he did a second voyage where he mapped a lot of that northern and western coast of, of Australia. He was later promoted to the Council of the Indies, which was an extremely powerful position, and he served on that for many years, and then he was made the, the governor of Banda for four years from uh, 1623. Dirt Hartog. Now, this is a, a pretty incredible story as well. He was sailing along the west, the west coast of Australia at a place we now know as Shark Bay, and he decided to go ashore at a place that we now call Dirt Hartog Island. This was on the 25th of October, 1616. And he decided to commemorate um, this event by uh, getting a, a pewter plate from his ship and using a nail, he inscribed a message on that pewter plate. And it is the, the oldest known written artifact uh, in Australia's European history. Um, and on that plate, he wrote, 1616, on the 25th October, arrived the ship Endhart of Amsterdam, supercargo. So the supercargo was the, the senior VOC officer on board. Supercargo Giles Mybus of Liege, skipper Dirk Hartogs of Amsterdam. On 26th, 27th of October, she set sail again for Bataan. Deputy supercargo Jan Stins, upper steersman Peter Dawes of Bill in the year 1616. And he left that, he put that on a post and he left that in the, the sand on Dirk Hartog Island. And then 80 years later, another Dutch East India skipper by the name of Willem de Vlemich came along that same beach. He was walking along the beach where his foot struck something that sounded metallic. And he had found the Dirt Hartog plate. So he got another plate from his own ship and he inscribed the same message that Hartog had put on the original plate along with a little inscription of, of his own. And he put that on a post and, and bashed it into the, um, uh, the sand. He took the original plate back to the Netherlands and it's now on display at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And I can tell you from experience, if you, you, Australia's always wanted this, this um, plate back because of its history with Australia. It's visited Australia on a couple of occasions, but the, the Australian government has always tried to buy it back from the Dutch who aren't giving it up. 
And if you ever want your own personal tour of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, all you have to do is go along and say that you're there to collect the dirt Hartog plate and take it back. Because they'll give you your own security guard to walk around with you for the rest of the day. <laughs> he even took this photo for me, which I thought was nice of him. But um, in 1801, when the, um, the Baudin expedition, the French expedition from the great Frenchman Baudin, was cruising along the coast of Western Australia, they called into Dirt Hartog Island. They found the, the blemish plate. They took it back to Paris, and after World War II, uh, the French government gifted that plate to Australia, and it's now on display at the Shipwreck Museum in, in Fremantle, if you saw it a few weeks ago when we were there. So Jan Cartis, or Jan Cartis, he, uh, he arrived at uh, the northern part of Australia, which we now know as Arnhem Land in 1623. He named that area after his hometown of Arnhem in the Netherlands, and he also, once again, cruised around the Gulf of Carpentaria. Francois Thyssen came along the, the, uh, using the roaring 40s of the Indian Ocean. He went along across the Indian Ocean and arrived at what we now know as Cape Lewin, the southwestern part of, of Australia, and he got permission from his supercargo, a man by the name of Jans Newt, to continue on and explore some of that southern coast. So for the very first time, that southern coast of Australia was, uh, was mapped as well. He went 1,500 kilometres along that coast up to where present-day Sedunia in Western Australia is before he was told to turn back and head for Batavia. And the, the Newt's archipelago in South Australia is named after the, the, um, the supercargo. And then the big one, Abel Tasman. So he was told to go to this new continent to the south. Uh, he left uh, and to see, to try and discover whether there was any trading opportunities, whether there was anything worth uh, purchasing from these, this land and whether there was people that were worth trading with. So he went south. He missed that south coast of, of Australia that Thyssen had, uh, had found. And he arrived on the 24th of November in 1642 in what we now know as Tasmania. And he named that Van Diemen's Land after the Governor General of the Dutch East India Company at the time, who had sent him on that journey. Uh, the local, he tried to speak to the local Aborigines, but they wanted nothing to do with him. In fact, they uh, built fires and tried to uh, force him away from the land. So he left there, understanding that there was no one there to trade with. He mapped part of that coastland along the, the coast of Van Diemen's Land, but then a huge storm came along and propelled him away to the east. And then he came across another country, which he called Statenland, uh, uh, Statenland, which we now know as New Zealand. He started mapping that country as well, and he ventured in and tried to speak to the Maori. And he was in a little bay, which he later renamed uh, Murderer's Bay, where the Maori attacked him and his men, and several of his men were killed. Don't know whether he said something derogatory about the All Blacks or something like that, but <laughs> he, he wasn't very popular there. And once again, he thought, there's no one here worth trading with, so I'm leaving. And he went north, he was trying to head back to Batavia. He went north and he discovered another country, which we now know as Fiji. And once again, he went ashore, and once again, the locals didn't want anything to do with him. And Fijian warri warriors attacked him and his men as well. So he left there. He must have been checking his deodorant, deodorant by this time because what was wrong with these people? So he hadn't really discovered anywhere worth trading for the VOC. He arrived back in Batavia, and you can read through the official report of his journey, um, and it tells, him, tells you about these places that he visited and the people that he came across. But in response to that, and so you can see here, this is the map of Australia at the time. The, some of the southern parts and the west coast and north part had been uh, mapped. And here's Van Diemen's land that uh, Van Diemen had done. And over here, the part of New Zealand that he mapped as well. And over here would be the, the part of, of Fiji that he, he visited. But when he got back to uh, Batavia, um, produced his report uh, saying that he'd, he'd done these, had been to these places, he'd done this uh, uh, cartography, the, uh, the, Dutch, the VOC wasn't very impressed with him at all. They said, well, you've got all these these lines on the map, but where do they lead to? What's, what do they connect to? There's nothing there. So they later lamented in their official response to his report that they should have sent a more persistent explorer. And even though we have na now named Tasmania after him, the Tasman Sea is named in his honour, 
the VOC weren't very impressed with him at all, and they gave him a job as a, a skipper of a cargo vessel just ferrying cargo between uh, ports as part of that, um, that uh, network of ports. Uh, in November 1649, he was charged by the VOC. He had hung one of his crew after a minor disagreement. Uh, that crew mem member actually ha was part of a very influential family and they complained to the VOC. So uh, Tasman was put on trial. He had to pay compensation to the, the victim's family and also to the VOC. He was demoted and it took him several more years before he was able to rise to the, the rank of captain again. So as I said, we consider him a great explorer, but the VOC weren't all that but happy with him. Um, now, as I said before, the, the VOC also ventured outside their, their sphere. And in 1609, a British captain, a part of the, uh, the VOC by the name of Henry Hudson, was looking for uh, the Northwest Passage, which was going to be a much faster and safer uh, trip from Europe across to the Far East. He never found it, but what he did discover was Hudson Bay in, in what we now know as Canada, and he went a little bit further south and he discovered the Hudson River as well, which is named in his honour. Um, Later on, the VOC established a, a colony at a place we now know as Albany in 1614. And then 11 years later, they established a trading post at another area that they called New Amsterdam. As part of the, the negotiations after the Dutch-Anglo War, the war between the Dutch and the English, um, the third war of that type, um, Amsterdam, New Amsterdam was ceded to the British and they changed the name of that place to New York. Uh, you've probably heard of it, so it's done pretty well since then. So the decline and fall of the VOC, it didn't take all that long. I mean, the VOC lasted for 200 years, but even uh, after 80 years of being established, it started to go into decline. There was a lot more global competition, especially from the British East India Company, which had become a lot more powerful, and they were making inroads into this area, but also the French and uh, the Spanish as well as well as the old Portuguese. There was a lot of um, the Napoleonic Wars when um, the Dutch were sided with Napoleon on some occasions and, and with the Allies on the other occasions. Uh, that caused a lot of problems for the VOC and just diluted their, their power and their influence. There was a lot of corruption and incompetence as well. Um, people wanted to go out to the Far East, to Batavi, to make their fortune, but they didn't want to stay out there for long periods of time. And when they left, they took all their intellectual uh, property, their intelligence that they knew with them, and people had to restart again. Uh, the Heron 17 was, as I said, the most powerful board in anywhere in the world, but it became political, and people were appointed to the Heron 17 for political reasons rather than their expertise in, in running or managing a, a huge corporation. And so there was incompetence at that level as well, and this all impacted, impacted on the VOC. After the fourth Anglo-Dutch War in 1780, the VOC once again declined to another level uh, in, um, in power. And then when their charter, which had supposed to last for 21 years originally, but had been renewed on every occasion, had been going for almost 200 years, when that came up for the renewal on the 31st of December 1799, it was decided that this company, this magnificent company that would have been so powerful, would not see in the new century and it was disbanded. A lot of people in the Netherlands tried to get it back again, tried to reform the, the VOC. But in uh, 1806, Louis Bonaparte, the brother of Napoleon, was appointed to the throne of the Netherlands. He understood the power of the VOC. Uh, he didn't want it to rise again, so he broke it up altogether, and it never rose from that. In 1811, Sir Stanley Raffles, who had founded Singapore, led a naval force and they attacked Jakarta and drove the Dutch out of that city. And then over the next few years, there were several negotiations with, between European powers. And in 1816, um, the Dutch were able to go back into uh, Jakarta or to Batavia and re-establish themselves there. And those negotiations saw what the, the Dutch took on what was known as the Dutch East Indies, the British took on India, Ceylon, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, those sorts of areas. The French were given uh, Vietnam and the Portuguese were stuck with a tiny little place of Macau near Hong Kong. And that's the way things stood. That's the way the, the status quo stood until the Second World War where the Japanese came through and they threw all of those uh, colonial powers 
out of those countries. After the war, the Dutch tried to go back into the Dutch East Indies to re-establish their, their empire there. But by this time, the Indonesian um, Independence Party had become very powerful. And there was conflicts broke out between the parties. But in 1948, uh, Indo Indonesia, as we now know it, was granted its independence. And it's now uh, an independent country, of course. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a bit of the history of the Dutch East India Company. There is just so much more. Like I said, it could take 10 talks to talk about the Dutch East India Company. But if it's whetted your appetite, you can go back and do some research into it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, my next talk's in a couple of days' time, where I'll be talking about some of the great shipwrecks that shaped history. So see you around the ship. Have a great time. Thank you very much.